This is Dr. Richard Schwartzstein. We're going to be talking today about an introduction to mechanical ventilation. Mechanical ventilators are used when patients develop respiratory failure, and they're often very mysterious to young doctors. But they, in fact, use really basic principles of physiology, which helps us to really understand how to manage a mechanical ventilator in a patient with respiratory failure. If we think about respiratory failure, it's really failure of the system, the respiratory system. And reminding yourself of what the components of the respiratory system are helps us to think about the ventilator. So what are those components? Well, we need a controller, something that sets the rate um, by which we breathe, the number of breaths per minute. We need a ventilatory pump, something that's going to push air uh, into the uh, lungs as well. A and we need a gas exchanger to have oxygen uh, get into the blood and ultimately CO2 to come out. And a failure of any one of these elements leads to respiratory failure. Uh, now, setting a rate is relatively easy from the standpoint of engineering and getting a machine to do that. And the gas exchanger, at least from an oxygen standpoint, we deal with by giving supplemental oxygen. So that's not all that hard either. The real essence of thinking about mechanical ventilators often then devolves to understanding the ventilatory pump. So in order to pump air uh, into the lung, we have to go back to one of the core principles of physiology, which is Ohm's law, and thinking about a tube uh, that we want to get a flow of gas uh, through. And we have pressure on each end of this tube, a P1 and a P2. And from the standpoint of the respiratory system, we might think of P1 as the pressure at the mouth and the P2 as the pressure at the alveolus. So somehow I've got to get a pressure differential. And so that delta P in Ohm's law, delta P is equal to flow, represented by a V with a dot over it, times resistance. And the delta P in this case is P1 minus P2 is equal to flow times resistance. Now the original ventilators that were developed were negative pressure ventilators, like an iron lung. And they worked uh, reasonably well for people that had not too much resistance and not too much stiffness to the respiratory system. And the negative pressure basically reduced the P2, the pressure at the level of the alveolus, and then that generated a pressure gradient so that air would flow into the lungs. And then the alternative, the one that we use most of the time clinically now, is a positive pressure ventilator in which we elevate the pressure at the mouth, the P1, and that now has generated a pressure differential that allows us to move air uh, into the lung. So let's uh, try to draw out what's really happening in this case. Uh, and I'm going to use a simple model with a tube that leads to what might look like a balloon on the end of it. Uh, and if we think about this in the context of the respiratory system, we have P1 here, again, that might be the mouth, and P2 here in the alveolus. Uh, and so here's the same P1 and P2 as we had thinking about that simple tube. Now as I push air in, I have to overcome resistance in the tube, but as I begin to expand the balloon or in the biological system, the lung and the chest wall, I also have to deal with elastic forces or elastic recoil forces uh, because there is a recoil to the lung and depending on the volume, uh, the chest wall may recoil inward as well and I have to overcome that. That's sometimes referred to as the stiffness of the system or another way to think about this recoil force is the stiffness of the system and can be represented as the compliance that to give a certain change in volume, I have to generate a certain change in pressure. So I've got resistance and I have compliance, two basic physiologic principles to consider as I'm going to move air into the lung with a mechanical ventilator. Now as I push this air into the lung, now with a positive pressure ventilator, again overcoming resistive forces as well as these elastic forces, I have to do work. And the pressure that's required to do this is kind of a representation of the work uh, that I'm doing on the system. So I'm now going to graph this by looking at pressure over time during a single breath as an example. So in this example, I begin to push air in. I increase the pressure at the mouth. 
And so I'm increasing the pressure, air is going into the lung, I'm overcoming resistive and elastic forces, and then I stop pushing the air in. And I don't let any of the air come out and the pressure will plateau because I have filled up the lung to a certain degree now, or the balloon if we use this simple example. And so the pressure now is plateaued because no more gas is going in and no gas is coming out. And then I might open the valves and I let the gas come out and pressure would go back down to zero. So I have two pressures here at this point. I have a peak pressure and then I have a plateau pressure. The peak pressure when I'm blowing the air in and the peak pressure again is overcoming both resistive forces and the elastic forces. So this is representing overcoming resistive and elastic forces. Whereas the plateau pressure is only representing what I have to deal with from the stiffness of the system or if you will the elastic forces that are in play. So the differential between the peak and the plateau, this differential right here, between the peak and plateau pressure is telling me what the impact of the resistive forces are because the elastic forces are present in a sense both for peak and plateau. So this differential between the peak and plateau ordinarily is less than 10 centimeters of water pressure. That's telling me under standard ventilatory conditions that the resistance is normal. If the differential was greater than 10 centimeters of water pressure, that's probably an abnormal resistance, as one might have with somebody, for example, with asthma. Uh, if I have high elastic forces, a very stiff lung or stiff chest wall, both the peak and the plateau pressures would be elevated, and the differential between the two of them would stay the same. So if I'm having problems with high pressures on the ventilator, as I push air in with a positive pressure ventilator, I have to distinguish whether this is affecting primarily the peak pressure or primarily the plateau uh, pressure to understand better whether or not I'm dealing primarily with um, an a resistive problem or with an elastic problem in the system. So these are some of the essential uh, physiologic principles, resistance and elastance or compliance uh, that come into play as we begin to conceptualize how we're using a mechanical ventilator and employing our core physiologic principles to understand the use of this therapeutic instrument for patients with respiratory failure.